All right. Hi, Josh. We're now Hi. live. Hello. So, um, yeah, uh, we were chatting just a little bit before, but um, if you'd like to introduce yourself a, a little to the, the class, and we'll kick off this dis discussion about narrative research and for whom the bell tolls. Okay, um, my name is Josh Rosenberger. I'm in my about my second or third extended year of the curriculum and instruction program. Um, I teach full time at the English Language Institute on campus as an ESL instructor, and I'm currently teaching sort of an intermediate to high intermediate reading and writing class and speaking and listening note taking class. Um, that's basically about it. I've, I've got two kids that are downstairs and I hope they don't start yelling and screaming here while I'm, while I'm talking. But that's oh, about it. Mine, mine are upstairs. Let's hope they don't come down. But if they do, we'll, we'll have a nice little cameo. So it'll, it'll sure. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, um, narrative research. Uh, I, I think we were just about to, to, to get into the, the discussion before we hit the, the go live button with this. But um, one of the most interesting approaches, as you were saying, yeah? It's, it's definitely one of the most interesting approaches in that um, the, I guess, the role of the researcher changes from this sort of objective, um, I guess let's say, reporter of objective analysis and, and I guess what seems like tangible data um, and s something that's sort of, um, I'm going to say, not intangible, but anyways, the role of the researcher changes to that of an intimate, personal, um, sort of, let's say, almost almost novelist in a sense. Like, they, they, they're taking information from the participants um, or the, the people that they're working with, and they're trying to create a cohesive story that represents some relevant topic or theme that, that there is, the, is the focus of the research. And so... Really, you have to be able to, first of all, work with people very intimately and, and gain their trust in ways that, um, say, a, a researcher doing a um, quantitative study wouldn't have to do necessarily. Um, and then second, you're trusted with taking their, in some cases, life story and presenting it to the world in a way that is relevant and also fair, you know, um, and is perhaps like, some, something that could, could create some sort of substantial change, I mean, depending on the study, um, which we can maybe talk about a little bit uh, for, the, for whom the bell tolls, but um, it, it, after reading this, it almost made me want to do a narrative study just because it would uh, allow me to be a little bit more creative in a lot of ways in putting together this, this cohesive narrative of, of whatever you know, my, my participants are, are, are telling me. Um, so it's, it's very different than, than all the other approaches, I think. In yeah, and I have to say that I, I think uh, in a similar way, and I, again, was, I, you know, in reading these, rereading these chapters and um, uh, looking through some of those, those other articles on narrative research this week, um, I'm, again, inspired to, to, you know, explore this process in, in more depth because um, there are those fundamental questions that you have to ask about the representation of information I I across the board, um, and um, as we, you know, touched on in, in this course, the uh, representation of, of data in the scientific method with um, quantitative um, statistical analyses um, is again. Uh, a, uh, a series of choices that are made to represent uh, uh, information and uh, knowledge in a certain way. And um, this tradition, the narrative tradition, um, kind of exposes that narrative element of everything we do um, and, uh, and, and seems kind of in tune with some of our more postmodern uh, realities. So. Um, it, it, it really is, um, it gives that kind of vehicle to reflect upon um, uh, the nature of uh, academic discourse and, and what it means to be constructing knowledge. Um, so it, it's fascinating stuff. So in terms of the uh, for whom the bell tolls then, um, let's think about uh, a few of those, those elements that you've just touched on. Um, the the construction of the this this story there and and maybe you know we'll, 
when I, I think of this article, I, I, the voices always jump out at me, and I, I always think of the, the people involved. But um, if we take a step back to consider the framework of this study and the, the role of the researcher here, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. So she, based on my understanding of, of where what her framework was, um, what her goal was in constructing this narrative, um, it, she's got more of a, a a critical a critical framework that she's coming from. Um, I think she's coming from the perspective that um, she identified uh, a problem or or challenges in alternative schools. Um, she found a case study or an example that she could work with, um, and she set out to get to know all of the voices within that school as well as she could in order to construct some sort of narrative that represents what she thinks. Uh, is the the biggest challenge to these schools, and namely um, the conflict between administrators, um, and st teachers, and then the students who all these higher ups are trying to serve. But um, really, I mean, she's she's coming from this perspective that uh, alternative schools uh, have voices that aren't being heard, and she wanted to give a voice to. These, these these students in a way that she felt probably wasn't being represented represented and maybe couldn't be represented unless I mean ex, um, if it weren't say a narrative approach um, I think that for her uh, I think it's am I right is it, it's a woman that, yeah it was, it was yeah um, it is yeah it is. Joining you can right yeah. Um, yeah. I think that she she took a narrative approach to this because it's really the most valid way um, to give. Um, I guess re real representation and relevant representation to the voices of these students. If she were just number crunching um, the scores or the, even even the attitudes, like let's say she just did a simple survey re um, study, then I don't think that it would have the impact that it, um, a narrative study gives these voices in this in this article. Yeah, I, I can completely agree with you, and I think the first point that you made there about this being um, in a, a critical theoretical paradigm is absolutely correct and and that's that's kind of interesting um, and really what that that means is that um, she has a, a, a fairly overt political aim in terms of writing this and that is to um, bring to the forefront those voices that have been silenced and marginalized within that uh, that community within this the school community so um, with that in mind uh, I, you know, you you then uh, look at well, how is she then gone about constructing these uh, restoring of their experiences in order to get at that point that there, you know, there are things that we need to recognize that perhaps are not the way that alternative education should be in terms of how it was founded in, in progressive principles and so on. So I think that, that um, you're picking up on that overtly political focus of this um, is key to understanding. Um, the, the, I don't know if you have anything further you, that you want to comment on that. Um, I think it's very interesting. Um, I, I was just going to say really uh, the the people that she chooses to focus on when she actually um, restories the the story I mean I guess the the narrative that she presents is is a really interesting um, contrast of all of these five different voices and I think that she she chooses the five most strategic people that she could because in her study from my understanding she was embedded in the school working with students and participating as a volunteer and as a in class helper and and whatnot fairly extensively and she probably got to know I mean, it's a small school. I think it was like 150 students or something. I think she got to know pretty much everyone in the school, including administrators, teachers, and students, and then also staff like the security officer. Um, and so her, I think her choice of these five voices um, was very strategic and and with the goal of trying to make the most impact on her presentation of the stories. Yeah, I mean, and you can uh, you can see in the in the selection and of how she's organized those stories that the she's um, touched on um, conversations and points that have overlapped so you have um, uh, statements about the both of the, the students um, from you know various uh, teachers and mr. hard and uh, 
and the principle. Um, and, and so you, you you feel that sense that the stories are intertwined in that way. And that, I mean, by this, by the way that it's it's presented, it seems as though um, Holly and and Jose, isn't it? Um, is that the yeah? I think so. Um, those are the students that um, are perhaps the two largest or greatest troublemakers are identified as troublemakers by the the teachers. So I, as you say, very very strategic in the selection, which again um, suggests that this is something that has a specific um, intent rather than in, intending to be representative of you know many of those voices that could be perhaps more sympathetic to understanding the frameworks of the school or 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 at least less um, overtly rebellious um, so uh, yeah and a very interesting point the let's let's talk about those those stories a little bit um, there, there's a these conversations can lead in so many different directions that I'd, I'd like to touch on ethical uh, you know considerations in terms of the, the narrator's perspective there um, but let, let's first talk about um, the, the different perspectives that were outlined and how those stories kind of dovetailed together you want to talk about the different um, characters? Sure um, you know, first I'll just say articles like this really do give you a lot to talk about. And again, I, I kind of feel lucky that I got to read this and, and talk about it a bit because it's much more interesting <laughs> than reading some statistic film quantitative study that um, I may or may not understand and that I probably wouldn't want to talk about all that much. But um, anyway, so we've got the security guard, Mr. Hard, a pseudonym, obviously. Um, and all the pseudonyms for the names. Are, are pretty interesting for the administrators and staff at least but his name is Mr. Hart and the reason is because he's basically um, a very uh, strict dogmatic security guard or security officer who has been employed at the school just from I think like a year ago or something when she started the study so he's only been around for a little while and his entire purpose is to basically create rules and make sure that the rules are enforced in the school and then when they're not enforced or when they're when the rules are broken he gets to enforce them um, as dogmatically and as strictly as possible. Um, and again, I think my favorite quote from him is, I don't care if the kids like me, I just want them to follow the rules, you know? And that's that's his whole perspective right there. Um, he's he's never really worked in an um, educational setting. He was a police officer. Um, I think he's probably used close to retirement, and he, he got this job at the school, and so he took it up. But um, what he does is he just, he's got a zero tolerance, po zero tolerance policy. And when kids break the rules, they go to him, and he prefers that they remain afraid of him so that they follow the rules. You know, they've got some sort of order in the school. Yeah. You know, just speaking of favorite quotes, this is this is my one, and I think it shows, uh, you know, the, his understanding, or at least his understanding as represented by uh, Jung Hoo Kim. Um, so, you know, my, my job here is to inculcate rules to kids. Some of you go to football games on Sunday afternoon. When there are no referees, what kind of game is it? Um, is it going to? It's going to be a mess, right? With referees and rules, we have an organized game, um, and I think that is is fantastic because um, basically it, anybody who has played a, a, a team sport um, and played a team sport for fun with their friends, um, knocking a ball around in, in whatever sport or, or you know just playing for fun, knows that you can quite easily uh, enjoy yourself playing uh, for your own entertainment and, and or organize that and it, it works. Um, you add a referee to the game and it raises the stakes in terms of competition exponentially. And you start, you find in, in competitive games that people do things uh, to get at the referee or to give the player a little bit of something extra because this is a competitive game and so on. So, it, you know, it's interesting that um, it, it, it highlights one of those kind of narrative blind spots. The, the, the perspective, I think, of the... Um, uh, that is represented there indicates, uh, at least in my reading, a, a lack of understanding about the, what a referee can mean to a game. And that's the thing, when he makes that statement, at first you're like, oh, that makes sense. You know, of course, you need someone there that can control this, this game that's going on within the school. But then you think about it a little more and you realize that, again, I mean, what do players do in a game? They antagonize the ref if they can. Um, and, and also, is it even a fair analogy to say that a school is a game? 
you know, and to say that really a school needs a referee in order to maintain, make sure that everyone is following the rules because it may not even be a fair analogy. You know, right, I mean, I'm right. sure it is somewhat analogous, but not entirely. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the, the other interesting uh, characters is uh, Holly, uh, Goofy Snoopy. What did you make of her and her story? Um, you know, it, obviously she does cause some problems in the school, and there's no doubt that she's got behavior issues and, and challenges that need to be dealt with. But really, I mean, thinking about kids that I would like to work with in my future, she's one of those kids, I think, because I feel like I can relate to her in some way if I were her, her teacher or um, some working with her in some capacity. But um, really, I mean, you think about it, what we learn from this story and what you don't hear from, say, Mr. Hard or Miss, Miss Boys, the, or Boise, the, the teacher or the principal. Mm -hmm. um, who's the principal? Let's see here. Uh, well, Mrs. Principal, I guess, is what she calls her. Yeah. yeah. What, what we learn in Holly, from Holly's voice is that Holly has had um, a really difficult life, you know, and, and this is something that, the security officer, Mr. Hard, the teacher, the the principal, none of them um, really address this or even or even take it into consideration or mention it, and, and they're part of the narrative. So you've got this girl who's had this really difficult upbringing, um, but she's bursting with enthusiasm for for expressing her ideas, giving her opinions. Um, you know, she's obviously very very intelligent, um, and and that's one thing that the principal does point out. She knows she, or the the teacher, she knows that she's smart. But um, here she is in the school, and it's almost like she's bored to death. Um, she, she's not really used to working within a, a, a rigid system of, of structured rules and whatnot, so that doesn't work for her. And, of course, therefore, she's, she's trying to jump over walls and, and trying to work her way around different loops that she's supposed to go through when it's just not her nature. It's not her personality. But she's a fascinating uh, teenager. You know, She's got some really interesting interests. She's into, she's into punk. She was into goth before, but now she's into punk. Um, she, she has ambitions. She wants to be a lawyer. I mean, these are things that um, aren't recognized uh, and not. Th there's no emphasis put on these these really interesting aspects of her character by the administrators and and staff and whatnot. And I think that that's unfortunate. And that's part of the purpose of, it, of giving her this voice is that she's such a dynamic person. Um, but people like Mr. Hard look at her as just being a troublemaker without anything else there. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point, Josh. Um, there's that this creation of this dissonance between the the reality of the the voices of of Holly and, and Jose, who's also had a very troubled background, but again is expressive um, with, through his music and uh, he, you know his desire to um, play in the band and you know express himself that way, um, and this impression of control, troublemaking, and so on that needs to be. Uh, taken care of. So, uh, yeah, I think that's that, that's that's really key. Um, so, in in terms of how uh, the some of the and I, I shared a, a, an article. I'm I'm not sure if you had a chance to read it. It was an optional activity, so it wasn't expected. But um, some of those different ideas, uh, the 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 literary um, aspect of this, the fact that um, uh, at, at later on in the article. Um, the fable is shared, um, and, and that's used to kind of add some, you know, further discussion to the um, the situation. And um, within the actual telling of the the lives of the the principal and, and Miss Bowes, and uh, what are some of the the, the kinds of uh, techniques that are used there to to present that information in such a way that um, it causes that reader to be able to understand that dissonance in voices. Um, this is one of the really interesting things about narrative writing um, and the narrative approach. Uh, and one of the reasons why, again, I'd like to do it because it requires some creativity on the part of the author and the researcher because apparently with a study like this, when you represent these voices in your, in your restoring of their voices, um, you can use different tones. Um, uh, the tone changes for each, for each voice. You know, you can when you're listening to Holly, it's the voice of Holly. You can tell that it's a 14 or 15 year old high school girl. When it's Mr. Hard, it's just straightforward, short sentences. Um, you know, very top down approach, and it sounds like a 50 some year old police officer talking basically. Um, when you listen to uh, Miss Bose and and Mrs. Principal, it's the same thing. Like their voices really come out in the tone of the writing, um, and also the formality of the writing. Because when you're when you're reading um, Jose and you're reading um, 
Holly, uh, the, the, the formality of the writing changes and, and the author starts to employ um, different phrasal structures and uh, less formal grammar um, to, to sort of represent the idea that these are young people talking um, and they're not, they have a completely different uh, voice than say the principal or, or the teacher. So I don't know if I'm right in saying that, but it just seems like the, the tone and the formality of the writing, um, it really changes because it's first person, you know, they're, they're, she's using first person, um, first person perspective and, and so she really basically places herself in the mind and the voice of that, of that person and tries to represent it as accurately as possible. Therefore, the creativity that went to this is, is huge. I mean, you have to be creative. And at, at the same time, you've got the challenge of being creative but not misrepresenting those people's views and, and voices. Right. Now, that's a key point um, because um, in this uh, uh, particular form of inquiry, um, the researcher uh, has an obligation to share back the, the stories that have been constructed through the conversations that she's had with the uh, people that she's investigating and say, is that correct? Is that what you want to be represented as? Is this accurate? And, and you know, the um, otherwise we, we get into kind of a, the, a more fictionalized account of, of those experiences. Uh, there, there has to be that uh, uh, member checking and there has to be that ability to um, have people verify or, or, or disconfirm if, if that's the case. If they say, look, um, I don't want that to be included about me. Um, I mean, I, I, and I wonder, <laughs> I wonder, because if, you know, you were in any one of those administrative kind of positions, teacher, principal, or the, the, the hard guy, maybe the hard guy wouldn't care so much, I mean, from what you get of a sense, but that line that the principal says, I mean, uh, it's, it's fantastic. About her horses, she just goes completely off topic. Um, it's like, uh, they know have a ranch home far away from the school with three horses, they know that. Um, uh, yeah, we like horses. Sorry about the digression. Well, that, that's the thing. I mean, there's obviously strategic pieces of information about each character that's included in order to paint a picture of what this person is and for us to understand the relationship between the students and the administrators in a way that, that is pretty accurate because by including that, that little piece about the horses, again, it seems entirely off topic, but obviously there's a purpose here for including it. There's a reason for including it. Um, and without that, we wouldn't we wouldn't understand so well this disconnect between the principal and the students, and where she's coming from, the life that she lives, and the life of the students. And she acknowledges, yeah, the students know that. And it's almost like she says it without even thinking that. Well, they know that, but I mean, what does that mean to them? You know, and what does this what does this imply about me as as the principal of the school, and how detached I am from um, the reality that that they experience, the students experience every day. Um, but there's lots of, of pieces of information, and same thing with Mr. Hart. I mean, she talks about what he does um, for hobbies. Um, you know, his, his favorite pastime is going to, to Home Depot or whatever, or, or Lowe's in order to do home projects and whatnot. Um, and for each of the students, I mean, they, they each have these these really interesting things that seem like almost off topic, but it, it paints the picture that we need to to have in order to better understand the dynamics of the relationships in the school, and um, really just the disconnect and, and I guess. Yeah, the, the fact that the administrators don't have a clue what's going on in a lot of ways. Like, they don't know their students, and the students know the administrators. But the question that I asked myself then after reading this is, like, who knows who better? Do the students know the administrators better than the administrators know the students? And I would say probably, probably so. Um, and I want to actually get back to the one thing that you said about um, how you have to basically collaborate with your participants as you're writing this. Um, you've got to go back and verify uh, the accuracy of these stories. And so again, a participant could say, please don't put that in there. Obviously when um, the researcher went to the principal and presented this and said, I'm going to write, include this part about the horses, I'm sure the principal was as happy as could be that, oh yeah, of course, include my horses. I mean, they're my, they're my life, you know. An important um, part of my personal life. Thank you for including yep, yep. But um, it's interesting because I wondered, you know, I would imagine that when the researcher presented these stories to each individual individually and isolated from the actual um, cohesive narrative, yes. my guess would be 
that the principal, when she read that, she thought, this is 100% accurate. This is great. This is who I am. And when the, the security officer, who probably, again, cares the least, read it, he thought, this is me. This is it right here. I mean, that's who I am. Same thing with the, with the teacher, Miss Bose. You know, I'm sure she's like, this is how I teach. This, this is what I think. But then when you put it all together into a cohesive narrative um, and you look at all the interconnected parts and whatnot, if, these, if the principal or the teacher or the security guard read that, they may not be as pleased with the um, representation that's given. And so my question would be, the researcher, is she required to present the whole thing at the end and say, look, this is what it's going to look like when it's all put together? Or does she only have to give each little individual part to the individuals involved? Because, um, yeah. if, if, again, if they saw this... Yeah, no, that's, that, that's it precisely, Josh. You hit the nail on the head. No, she's verifying the conversations that she's had with those individuals. Um, obviously, you know, um, you want to approach uh, your your studies with an open mind. So uh, you don't come into the school. I mean, you, you come in with the idea that, well, we need to explore what's going on in alternative schools. Um, you begin to see things in the school that don't seem right, there, that there is that disconnect between, you know, authority and the student's perspective. And you're like, well, you know, I need to capture some of this. I need to present this as it is. And, and so you're capturing those voices in an authentic context. And then from that, you, the themes are emerging out of this, and that is pulling your story together. So the, the conversations come first. And then the, out of the data, out of the looking at that and cross-checking that and referencing that, you can begin to create those themes. It's not that the themes would drive those conversations. So she can't or, or shouldn't be at a point of saying, well, here's the whole sh you know, story. But you know, you know, if, you're, if you're looking at that and, and conducting that piece of research, then you, know, you have to ask yourself the question, if you're going to continue to work in that school, how much you know, it would be appreciated once it is in a, published in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, uh, what have you done for your 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 prospects of of, of being appreciated in the staff room? Um, carry on. So, so one thing that I that I asked myself then about the researcher is how much bias did she actually bring into the this this study? Because if she came from the perspective that there's a problem with alternative schools and the problem is is that they don't meet the needs of their students and their, their students have um, no way to really, I guess express themselves in a way that fits their their specific personality challenges or personal challenges and whatnot. Um, this is just a, a very strict rule-based environment where they can't thrive. It's impossible for them to be successful in this environment. I and mean, if, if she came in with this perspective, then technically this is a biased study. Because oh, no. And, and here, remember, go back to the conversation we just had about who she has selected for this study. Um, the biggest problem students and the three individuals in the administration or staff that are, you know, obviously the most rule-based. Um, so y you have to ask that question. And, and more fundamentally, um, who is she and what is her research agenda? I, I mean, and you can look this woman up, and I've done so in the past, uh, and she, you know, you will see her academic page at an institution and, and what she's interested in. Um, but why? Why are, why did people publish? Why did people um, seek to pursue a certain approach? Well, you know, and, and this is not something that I think necessarily is the case. I'm not casting aspersions about an individual's integrity here. But these are just fundamental um, questions that we need to ask. Um, is the publication of research that takes those relationships, those participant relationships, and ultimately benefits the researcher through progression in their academic careers or through publication in a peer-reviewed journal, but doesn't have any benefit for those people that were involved in the study, or at least some of the student uh, people that were involved in the study. Uh, it, again, it touches on that those those questions of um, you know bias and and purpose and 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 I personally, I mean, I think that those are. That's an aspect of, of the voice of the researcher in this that isn't present. She says, 
uh, she then moves on to the narrative, her, her, the, the first person narrative role of the researcher, but there isn't that who I am. She gives the who you know they are from that perspective, but there's no characterization of her as a character in the story. But she is. Her voice is the character in the story. She's putting it all together. It's the thing that isn't there. Um, so I think you know that's precisely it. We we have to look at this um, in terms of the the, the narrative um, pulling together as someone in another context pulling this together. Um, it, it 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 really is a a, a fascinating uh, piece. And that's why I think taking a narrative approach would be so challenging because again. Really, to do it well, to do it fairly, to do it without bias, you have to walk in there with a completely open mind and just say, I have some general ideas of what may or may not be, but let me start to participate um, firsthand and, and intimately with my subjects here, and let's see what themes I can start pulling from this experience over time. You know, I think that it really has to happen over time. It can't be a short-term process. It's got to happen over at least a few months, if not a year or more. And to pull those, those themes and to sort of really focus your research fairly would be a huge challenge because if you have any biases walking in, that's going to sort of string you along in that direction to where maybe, I mean, maybe it's not a fair place to go. I mean, maybe it's not the, the best place to go. But then again, maybe this is what the school is all about and these administrators represent um, the majority of the instructors and the administrators in the school and these two student voices represent the student body and what we have here is a perfect example of an alternative school that is failing um, where administrators are getting paid a lot of money and students are falling through the cracks and, and dropping out and becoming I guess um, what would I say <laughs> miscreants in society yeah you know there's a, a couple of points there um, and one is I think that we, we I mean we have to understand that there there it's I mean, to divorce our, our personal perspectives, um, our biases from our, the construction of our stories is, you know, fundamentally impossible. Um, we're bound by the language, linguistic structures that we're using that are formed upon our experiences and, and, and you know, the socio-cultural context, context in, which we're, in which we exist. But the, um, the point is that you can make those biases clear. You can expose your own biases um, and and understanding you know who you are and where you're coming from and the, your positionality in regard to the, the context I think is is really key in in allowing other people allowing your readers to make the determination of, of whether or not you are being authentic it's part of that creating that trustworthiness to, to expose who you are as the researcher. So so how would you go about doing that? In this article, I don't feel like the researcher's done that very well, but how would you go about doing that formally in, in a narrative-based or approached article? Well, I, I think you talk about who you are and what you, you're, you're doing going into this study, why you have um, decided to pursue this originally. And then, you know, there always is that, that other little voice in your, your head that says, well, that's what I'm saying I'm doing. Um, but again, um, you know, there, there are maybe other potential biases that are really fairly uncomfortable to reveal, uh, certainly to, to a, a public audience. But um, I think that you can do that. I think that you can reveal, let, let's say if I were doing a, a study of online education and I'm director of um, instructional design and technical support and I decide to take a narrative appro approach at the university then it, it, and I interview faculty and students and, and staff and administration and, uh, and, and clearly um, I think you know I, certain ways about online education then I have to, to reveal what my thinking is um, in order to, to provide that you know, a juxtaposition of my perspective and my voice to this story. So I, I think really just um, uncovering um, to the extent possible uh, you know, those biases within this type of approach allows the reader to understand where, that, where, where you're coming from. Because the only thing I have on this author, Jung Kim, is based on what I've been able to infer from this article right here. And what I've inferred is that 
she has a very strong position on this issue, and it comes out in in her article. But aside from that, I mean, I have to just assume that she she saw a problem when she walked in here, and she found it. She basically corroborated it with um, her study uh, and working with these participants. And then, yeah, but there's no other it may, mention. It may be the case. I mean, this is an article in um, that has specific purposes. Um, but it may be the case that she did this study as part of her doctoral dissertation, um, and there all of her uh, data, all of her research for those three months that she was in the school is transcribed and in appendices, and in that in that dissertation she has written more clearly what her, her perspective is. That, and I, that's the kind of thing that you know, doesn't come out in you know, this, that requires further research around the, the, the article itself to better understand. But I could see that as being you know, three months part of that, that, that process. Um, but it is. It served potentially as a stepping stone, a gateway uh, to the academy. Um, so you know, in, in terms of completing that, that, that you know, serve that purpose, but those that's the backstory. That's the piece that, that you know, isn't there in this. Um, and and it, to be honest, it probably doesn't work. I mean, if you were to find that in this piece, it would it would cause the narrative to be broken in some way. Um, it would it would it wouldn't fit with the the, the, the story that is being retold here. So I, I can see how that wouldn't be necessarily what you would include in this context, but it, it, it really is an interesting part of this that um, if we're being critical consumers of this research that we have to ask ourselves. Well, and um, again, you know, all of that, even all of that aside, it doesn't take away from the fact that this article really presents um, the let's see. After reading this article, it becomes clear that narrative, the narrative approach is, is just a it's a powerful way to present research, and, um, yeah, and it, it may so, be so skillful. I mean, the 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 use of um, that that epilogue, the voice of the researcher, when she talks about the stork and the fox, what a and what a wonderful way to just take the story to a, another level. Um, and and talk about the dishes that are laid before our students being a problem with the people who are um, presenting the fair as opposed to the people that are are not you know in, enjoying what's on the table. I, I mean, I, I thought that was just a wonderful movement, in, in a wonderful, skillful step. Yeah, I, I thought so as well. And it's it's the type of writing that you wouldn't see in so many other types of um, research articles. You you would just never see that. So. Again, it just this 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 approach, writing a narrative, um, taking a narrative analysis approach, allows the researcher to sort of bend what seemed like rules that couldn't be um, weren't all that flexible before. But actually, I mean, this, this approach allows a lot of flexibility in the writing of the research and the creativity involved. Um, and it, you would have to be incredibly skillful because again, you have to do it well. You have to do it in a way that seems authentic. Um, that has trustworthiness or seems to be free of bias um, and in a way that it's going to be impactful in some way when it's all when it's all done and after reading this article I'm sure there are a lot of people who are continuing to think about alternative high schools and the nature right. of alternative high schools yeah the um, and that that I think you know that's what she touches on at the end I mean what is the purpose of, of this study um, the I was just looking down there um, <laughs> my books on my lap here but the uh, um, at page 399, or I'm in the other textbook at this point, but um, she says it should be considered a metaphor of, of the possible life inside other public alternative schools experience similar tensions and struggles. So that idea of this is a metaphor, this is, you know, we're not talking about uh, something that is exactly this way. Um, we're not you know, these are stories that, if you look at the, the the potential complexity of the lives of those those administrators and teachers, there's no way that this is a fair representation of the depth of their perspectives. Um, although they've kind of agreed to that too, but that this is this is something that allows us to dig deeply um, at these 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 more fundamental issues that we're experiencing in these schools. So while 
the population is very narrow. The potential is is huge to impact people's thinking because it it connects with them at some very um, uh, personal level. Your mic is muted. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm digressing a bit, but um, I meant to I meant to talk about this before, and I just kind of skipped over it because I'm kind of nervous you know, doing this whole online live chat, but. Um, you know the the framework that you were talking about. You asked me what the theoretical framework of it was, and I meant to talk about this, but really, like where she's coming from, um, she took the perspective of this Bactinian, or I don't know how you say that exactly. Is it yeah, Bactinian. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to talk about this. It's probably water under the bridge at this point. No, I, I think it's one of the most fascinating um, uh, aspects of the article. Right, and and uh, I wish I had, had discussed it earlier, but anyways, I'll just say that. Um, to me, it seemed like uh, this this type of approach for for a narrative study um, and this this Bakhtinian frame or novelness, I guess, where she makes an attempt to provide first of all a diversity of voices. So she's got the polyphony of the 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 the, the idea of polyphony, where there's all these different voices that are speaking, and then she's got the idea of chronotype, where the setting and the time of the actual place where the, the study is taking place are sort of given life, and and the reader can understand like what is the context that the study is taking place in, um, and then this idea of carnival, which to me is kind of like chaos, basically. I mean, where you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, this is the real world. These are, you know, anything anything is possible. Um, that that whole approach is is very well represented in the writing and in the four different or five different voices that she presents in this, and um, I just I had never really. Um, thought about this as a theoretical approach before, and I didn't even know anything about Bakhtin, or, or I don't know if it's Bakhtin, but Bakhtin. Um, Bakhtin. Um, but it's a, it's a really interesting way um, for her to sort of inform her, her approach in this, um, in, in the interaction, especially in the representation of voices. Um, and so I was wondering, when you, when you go in and you were to write, in, if you're going to write a narrative, um, is it is this a, a very um, sort of fundamental framework that you might start with? This Bakhtinian framework is this common? Um, is this a common approach for a lot of narrative writing, or is this one that she just used for this specific study? And so I guess that was a question that I had. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. You know, um, Michelle Bakhtin um, is often referred to um, in terms of being a literary theorist. Um, so there's a, a lot of work of his that relates to. Um, his uh, writings in regard to uh, frameworks for understanding literature, which which makes him um, very uh, relevant for uh, the narrative approach, and y you will find that he is referenced in other areas in, in regard to narrative approaches. So uh, I think, um, yeah, it, I mean, it's not. Um, it wouldn't be un uncommon for someone to relate to um, or identify Bakhtin as um, someone who's been influential in terms of uh, their thinking about um, uh, a narrative inquiry approach. But I, I don't think it, it's, not, it's certainly not essential and it's certainly not, um, you know, this is the done deal. You just, you know, you re relate it to, to Bakhtin's framework. Um, that's something that is particular to this article. And, and in doing so, um, again, she raises the, the level of um, the, the approach to something um, uh, that is based uh, in a, a theoretical framework um, and one that has been used on, on numerous occasions before. And it's part of that situating in um, the, the, the theory of, of um, how we uh, operate in language that, that helps raise this to... to one of its, you know, levels of, of, of quality. So I, I think that's a, a, a really good question. Did I, did I answer it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think what you said about how it sort of lends, um, I guess, more of a schol scholarly aspect to the study because it really it provides her with a theoretical framework that she's constructing these voices and not just, say, throwing them all together based on a whim, more or less. But it's an actual, it's a, it's a valid framework that um, she, can, she can use. And and she does it, I mean, quite well. And it makes sense for her goal here, which is to represent all of these different voices. I mean, because that's a huge part of the theories or of the, the, the framework that there are different voices and they're not the same, and they should be allowed to speak in their own tones and their own attitudes and in their own formalities, in a sense. 
you know, they shouldn't be restricted in that. I think that was a huge part of it, that each voice is individual and unique, and so the goal is to represent those as accurately. I, I think it was explained to me as well. The, um, you know, in terms of the other, I'm glad you touched on that, because the other scholarly aspects of this work that help, again, um, raise, you know, the, the, the quality of the piece in, in terms of it um, also being recognized as uh, not just the sharing of different stories from different perspectives, but being uh, grounded in, you know, the, the academic discourse um, are the literature review and the identification of the, the um, approach of narrative inquiry. Um, so both of those aspects are essential um, in terms of justifying this particular approach um, because again it's not one that is mainstream within you know uh, uh, the research uh, community although in educational research um, uh, I think it's become uh, become to be uh, more accepted um, there's still some controversies there of course um, but um, you know identifying the background there and, and situating it in that um, uh, discourse is important to uh, it, it make, it, ensuring that it is um, a, a valid form of educational research and again a, a broad understanding of the literature um, of alternative schooling um, it helps make our point um, that we should be doing some things differently um, obviously it's a, a selective literature review here again um, but I thought it, it must be it must be incomplete this must be like an abridged version or something because it's not a very extensive literature review and I thought there's there's got to be more than that um, out there, but maybe maybe it's just a bridge or something. Well, yeah, the um, and I think Sam mentioned Sam Cook um, about you know finding articles and and the literature reviews and the articles aren't kind of the literature reviews that we're doing for this course and um, you know the things have different purposes and I think you got into the thesis and dissertations area, Josh, and um, that that is much more like um, the kind of literature review that belongs in a a, a, a thesis or perspectives as we're, we're writing in this course. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you, it may be the case that you know, much more was submitted to the article and uh, the page limit was such that that couldn't be added or the editors from the journal got back to the author and said, no, you know, I think you need to omit this, add more on this, um, you know, condense this, take out your individual background perspective, we want this to have that kind of focus. So, I mean, in that editorial review process, those changes can be um, suggested by that uh, committee as well. It is um, interesting. So, Josh, I, I'm sure we're... we're um, moving on in terms of time, it's been it's been great discussing this. It's like as you said. It is, and I mean, again, there's there's a lot, there's so much to talk about. I I just feel fortunate that I happened upon this article as for the week that I'm having this live chat because it's it's a really fascinating article. It brings up so many different issues, a lot that we talked about, of course, but a lot more that we haven't talked about so much. And it it inspires me to want to write to take a narrative approach. I'm not going to do it now, but um, at the very least in the future, I mean, I may look into it because there are a wealth of voices out there. Anybody who's working in education is surrounded by all these voices, and, and those voices come from experience, and the whole goal is to take that experience and turn it into something that's tangible and that can um, influence or make some sort of impact in this field of education that we work in. And I, I just think that it's got to be one of the most powerful approaches you can take because after reading this, even wh whether you agree or not, whether you see bias or not, you're still left thinking about it, and you understand so much more of what's happening on the ground than if you were to read a study that's quantitative, a quantitative, a quanti quantitative study or even other um, qualitative approaches that, that just don't offer the, the personal and int intimacy of, of the narrative approach. You know? Yeah. No, I think that's a great point, Josh. Um, it's like reading good literature, and, and literature that... Um, uh, open up, opens up your mind to thinking about perspectives in ways that you haven't thought about before. Um, you know, the, the the other part of this, and, and we touched on it kind of, you know, somewhat in, in her role as the, the researcher uh, participant in that community, um, is in this type of research, of course, um, 
and it, and and you know Walcott is is the example that we've discussed, and I don't know if you saw some of the the conversation on on how his relationship developed with Brad and. Um, Crazy! I can't yeah. even read that. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh. I, and if I had known that when I was reading it, it would have changed my perspective um, while reading it. But I didn't know until afterwards. Well, you know, and interestingly, um, he takes he writes another article um, called "The Aftermath of Life of a Sneaky Kid," where he takes um, a, a kind of um, a narrative approach to uh, you know the censure that he experienced after uh, this coming out about his research and and you know talking about this. Uh, again, in a in a retelling of the the experience of this, and you know he's a, I mean, a you, obviously th there's no justification um, uh, for what was done, um, but you know it, again that retelling of this it, it, as a means to understand the storied experience of an individual in its one representation, of course, uh, is a fascinating take on on um, how we understand um, the world and. Um, I think, again, the point I want to touch on is that with this type of research, those ethical considerations are absolutely paramount. Uh, and, you know, uh, just a level of um, ability to re reflect upon, uh, you know, your individual role in this and, and purposes we were, were talking on um, and how you are... Um, Involved in those people's lives in in ways that you know um, uh, when the article is published may have very real consequences. Those things need to to be very very carefully considered. So, and you know that's what I was one of the things I had written at the end of my notes was that it's really this interface of intimacy and objectivity. You know that when you're doing this type of research, it would be so hard not to cross the line um, inappropriately. You know, and and to maintain the distance while at the same time. Um, getting becoming personal and intimate enough with your subjects that you can actually gather the data that you need. Because if you don't, if you don't, if you don't establish a personal relationship, you don't have personal rapport, and, and you don't know them as individuals and as even friends, I would say, then you're not going to be able to represent their voice in a way that's powerful and relevant and accurate. So to me, it's like you're walking a tightrope, and and you're going to fall off at some point unless you really do your best to, to remain objective while still maintaining the personal relationship and trying to just make sure that you remember your role fundamentally is that of a researcher and so you can't have, I mean you, you can't cross that line but it would be hard not to because how do you gather information that is relevant and information that you need and uh, Wolcott's a perfect example um, I can't even believe that I mean at at some point he must have he must have just forgot what his role was you know and and, and thought okay am I because there's this blurring of who you are when you're doing this it's like what are you are you a researcher are you a friend are you a mentor um, kind of and how he and and how he presented himself then is so um, it's it, I mean it it just seems. Uh, Oh, it, 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 I, I don't even have the words to describe what a disgusting, uh, uh, manipulative move it looks like after. That's what it seemed like. That's yeah, what it I mean, like. you have a young um, uh, man on your property who, you know, could be um, classified as having certain special needs. He obviously has emotional difficulties. And, you know, you let him stay there and you get him work and you, you know, you spend a great deal of time in his tent. And, and you know, it's not for, you know, the, the research aspect of telling his story and doing this for those purposes. Ultimately, you read once you know that they've had this relationship. It, it, it just seems coercive and, and it, uh, manipulative and, you know, and other stronger words. <laughs> but um, that, that, that aside... Um, you know, my first read on that story, um, on Wolcott's um, The Life of a Sneaky Kid, I mean, just going back to my initial read of it, yeah, it was yeah. a much more powerful read than the um, I can't, the Hamley and, and whichever the first article yeah, was. Yeah, Hamley and Yeah, right, right. Um, It had so much more of an impact on me. And it still is just an example of how narrative writing can really just give voice to issues that you wouldn't, be able to understand as thoroughly and as intimately without yeah, yeah. the approach, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. But it, it brings up the perfect point. It's like how, I mean, how do you maintain 
objectivity? How do you make sure that you create this intimacy and this personal relationship without crossing the line? And I think it's a huge challenge for yeah, any narrative yeah. researcher, anybody doing qualitative research yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, your, your participants are not numbers. You know, they have names, even if they're pseudonyms. Right. They, they are people, and so you have a huge responsibility when you do this type of research. Yeah. Well, Josh, it's been absolutely wonderful having a conversation with you this morning. Um, thank you for uh, giving up that time, and uh, um, I'll get this posted, and I'm sure um, the rest of the class will enjoy the conversation as well. But um, I hope you have a, a lovely day. You too. Hope you have a good day. Yeah, and you know what happens here is I stop the broadcast, and then... Uh, um, you're still on. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a double good. Anyways, it's been it's been good talking to you again. I'm glad that I got this article because it was a really interesting discussion. You know, yeah. I got to be lucky. But anyways, I've enjoyed the conversation. All right. Thanks, Josh. Yeah.